dark, but oh well. Their monitors. What time is it? Okay. Just wait. Marcella's coming, yeah. right? Do that again. Yeah.
Yeah, that is sort of a first sight uh, way to uh, yeah, so estimate. Two hundred fifty pounds will be able to travel from that point. The main difference is that we won't have all the hourly work on the front end of collecting. We'll just have to sort it out. Are we live? Okay, well, um, in this new age, I'd like to welcome everybody to Emily uh, Thorne's PhD defense. Um, Emily comes to us from Southern California, but she got her bachelor's in wildlife and a minor in statistics at Humboldt State. I believe you arrived in 2015, 14 to take over the skunk project. And uh, it's, been, um, it's been a wild ride. I will say that all this notion about um, COVID-19 and social distancing with the Skunk Project and with Emily, we've been practicing social distancing for a long time because for several years, well, Emily, you didn't smell very good. So with, <laughs> with that, I'll let Emily take over and she can tell us about spotted skunks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford. I appreciate that colorful introduction. Um, also, thank you all for being here today, uh, for the few people that were able to make it out, as well as everybody else that's out there in cyberspace. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to uh, listen to my uh, presentation today. Um, I will be talking about the spatial ecology of eastern spotted skunks, uh, including their home range dynamics, resource use, and genetic differentiation um, across the central and southern Appalachians uh, in Virginia. Um, Eastern spotted skunks, yes, they are a species of skunk, but they are not your typical everyday backyard uh, striped skunk. Um, they are in the skunk family, but they're in different genus. genus. They're in genus Spilagale. And one of my favorite things about spotted skunks is that their scientific name roughly translates to smelly spotted weasel. And there cannot be a more accurate description of this species. Uh, they are the smallest members of the skunk family, easily distinguished by their four to six broken bands and their white tip tail. Uh, they're endemic to eastern North America, or at least most of it. Uh, they're a New World species like all skunks. Um, their range is a bit divided. They go down on the eastern side. They go down from the Appalachians from Pennsylvania to Florida. Uh, and then they are in the Midwest, across the west, west to the Continental Divide, and down south to Mexico. Uh, their range just barely but basically doesn't overlap with any other type of spotted skunk. They're reproductively isolated from western spotted skunks, uh, but they do overlap with the striped skunk. Uh, eastern spotted skunks, like I said, are the smallest in their family. They're roughly the size of a gr big gray squirrel or a pet ferret. Their size ranges from about half a pound to a pound and a half, females being closer to the half pound size, males being closer to the pound and a half size. Uh, they were once historically common. In fact, they were sought after for their beautiful, dense, plush coats. Um, in the early 20th century, they were captured by fur trappers um, in excess of 100,000 individuals range-wide annually. However, um, around the 1940s, there was a huge population decline, and it's currently unknown as to what that cause was, because spotted skunks weren't really researched back then. Um, Hypotheses include habitat loss due to uh, forest fragmentation from expanded uh, er, uh, agricultural practices. Also increased competition from these are predator release resulting from extirpation of large carnivores. And possible disease spread such as uh, rabies and distemper which has been a cause for decline in other small carnivores. Uh, currently, or from 2016, they've been listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list, but they are currently listed federally as of least concerned. A uh, handful of studies before I started have found them in uh, your young shortleaf pine habitats uh, or mixed hardwoods. Uh, they were all most likely found in dense, complex understory. 
and with closed canopy. Um, in Tennessee, they were associated with rhododendron thickets uh, that were also associated with riparian areas. And a few incidental captures in the central and southern Appalachians uh, were associated with emergent rocky outcrops and high elevation red spruce forests. Uh, in Virginia, they are classified as vulnerable. Um, that's mostly due to their apparent rarity and their absence for apparent absence for the landscape. There's a closed trapping season, uh, but little is actually known about their spatial ecology or their distribution, and that dictated the need for research for the species in Virginia. That brings us to my research objectives. Uh, my uh, dissertation had five chapters. Don't worry, I'm not going over all of them today. Um, but first chapter included identifying habitat associations at the geographic scale. My second chapter was to evaluate relationships uh, between spotted skunks and other carnivores. Uh, third chapter is to estimate home range size and resource selection. My fourth chapter was to evaluate den use and microhabitat selection, and then to assess the genetic diversity and population structure. Uh, today, I will not be talking about chapter two. Uh, I will just be focusing on habitat associations and genetics. Uh, so my first chapter, uh, identifying habitat associations at the geographic scale or first order selection. To do this, uh, we put out camera stations across the George Washington Jefferson National Forest. We used uh, trail cameras, remote sensing trail cameras, and we baited the cameras with roadkill deer. Uh, the reason we baited was because spotted skunks are hard to find, very fast, and very small. And by providing a bait source, it gave us more opportunity to actually get pictures of them. Whereas in passive sampling, even though they are present, they're very hard to detect without using bait. Uh, we created detection histories. So within, any tw within a 24-hour period, any ranging from one to infinity pictures was considered one detection for that 24-hour period. And if no pictures of spotted skunks were collected, it was considered a non-detection for that day. Uh, in total, we had 91 camera stations across two different years. Survey length varied from 14 to 62 days, and that was because some sites we got snowed out of and weren't able to get back to the camera. Sometimes we had uh, equipment malfunction, and then other times cameras were destroyed or removed by bears and or humans. Uh, in total, we found spotted skunks at 19 of our 91 sites. And we used a single species, single season occupancy modeling approach um, we pulled data from both years because there was no difference in uh, detection or occupancy for those data sets. Then we estimated probability of detection and probability of occupancy. Uh, we looked at variables such as uh, temperature, rainfall, snowfall, snow depth, percent moon illumination, and the occurrence of other carnivores to assess the probability of us being able to detect the skunk when it's present. And then to assess habitat associations, we looked at elevation, slope, forest type, distance to roads, water sources, and agricultural arable land, percent canopy cover, and forest and agent area. Uh, we found that detection was most heavily influenced uh, by percent moon illumination. Um, even though detection probability was very low to begin with, uh, it decreased as percent moon illumination or brightness at night increased. And this is actually very common amongst small mammals. Uh, most small mammal activity will decrease on bright nights as a predator avoidance. Uh, spotted skunks both eat small mammals and they are eaten by other things. So it could be twofold, one, reduce energy expense uh, when there's a less likely chance of getting prey, and then also to avoid being captured on a bright night by a predator, like in this case, an owl. Um, habitat association uh, was strongest with an interaction between stand age and elevation. And this is what that kind of looks like. Uh, we found that the strongest uh, association was with younger forest stands at lower elevations, which have been more recently harvested. Um, and then also this slightly smaller peak at a high elevation old growth forests, which have either never been harvested or haven't been harvested for over 100 years. Um, you might be thinking why these two different uh, forest types, there's a huge dichotomy. Well, both of these forests, even though they're very different from each other, um, are structurally complex, which could provide a lot of food resources, a variety of den sites, um, and then thermal cover and protective cover from um, bad weather and then also predators. Uh, when plotted across the George Washington and Jefferson National Forests, this is about what their habitat distribution looks like. 
In red is areas where there is a probability of 50% or higher that a spotted skunk would be using that site. And areas in gray are less than 50% probability of uh, site occupancy. The zoomed in portion gives you an idea of how small and spatially distinct these uh, areas of high predicted occupancy are, where the areas in red, orange, and yellow are about 50% or greater use, and then the areas in blue and green are very low probability of use. So management implications of habitat associations at the geographic scale. Um, low patch connectivity, that's the big takeaway. Um, if these patches are not connected, if they're separated by unsuitable habitat, um, they become isolated from one another. Um, this provides a higher extinction of local or higher risk of local extinctions within a patch, coupled with a lower um, probability of recolonization once those, that patch has gone extinct. Um, this can also lead to genetic consequences, such as loss of genetic diversity and inbreeding. So at the first order of selection, we found that their habitat is likely fragmented. Uh, for chapter three, assessing home range dynamics and resource selection, uh, this was a two-part um, assessment. Uh, we looked at second order selection, which is the placement of an individual's home range within a study site, and third order selection, which is the location, um, the skunk's locations within that home range. Uh, so to do this, we picked uh, four sites from our map that had either moderate to high probability of uh, skunk occurrence. Uh, we set out cam baited cameras to find the skunks. Once we knew that they were there, we put out traps. So we live trapped them and uh, deployed radio collars. We did this during the months of December through May in years 2015 to 2019. In total, we caught 25 adult skunks and that we were able to collar, seven females, 18 males. Uh, we tracked them to their daily daytime den locations at least one to two times per week. And when we could not physically track them to their location, we triangulated their locations. Uh, we, used, we combined all of those locations uh, to estimate home range size. I actually did this four different ways to make it comparable across a lot of different studies, but today I'll be talking about the 95% fixed kernel density estimate, which is the most commonly um, used method these days. So we compared home range size among sites in between sexes. We estimated percent overlap of uh, home ranges within site years. And then we conducted a weighted resource utilization function at both the second and third order levels to look at the effect of land cover type, forest fragmentation, and elevation. What we found is that uh, home range size, unlike other studies, did not differ between sexes, um, but they did differ between sites where North Track Mountain in West Virginia had the largest home ranges. Uh, and also home range side varied a lot among individuals where some males and females had small home ranges and other males and females moved around a lot. For percent overlap, we found that uh, overlap also varied by site, but not among sexes. And North Track Mountain had the lowest percent overlap. Uh, we attribute the differences in home range sizes and home range overlap to uh, possible differences in habitat quality where North Track Mountain may have lower habitat quality than some of the other sites, which follows a hypothesis that uh, limited resources leads to larger home ranges and less uh, overlap to avoid competition. Uh, for the resource utilization function, we looked at land cover first and found that hardwoods, uh, hardwood forests were selected over all other types of um, land cover. However, they were not selected significantly more than evergreen forests or mixed forests. Um, they were chosen almost twice as often as non-forested areas and shrub shrubby, scrubby areas. Uh, since the land cover, the different forest types were not selected different from each other, we lumped them all together to look at forest fragmentation and found that areas, core areas of forest over 250 acres, that's about uh, one kilometer <laughs> squared, um, were selected more often than um, all other fragment types. They were selected over four times more than non-forested areas, three times more than pa small patches less than a square kilometer, and about twice as often as um, edge habitat or perforated areas. For elevation, uh, we found that elevations less than 650 meters were selected over everything else with a little bit of a selection towards those higher elevations, which um, is consistent with our first chapter where they really preferred those low elevation young stands and the, the moderately preferred those high elevation old growth patches. 
So we looked at home range size and found and home range overlap and found that there are differences by sites but not by sex um, and that habitat quality may be influencing um, home range dynamics. And then we found that land cover types um, did were selected for and chosen non-randomly. Um, and that forested large forest patches are selected over everything else and preferably at uh, the lower elevations. So management implications of uh, second and third order selection um, include Spotted skunks might not be as generalist as we originally thought they were, like their striped cousins. Um, habitat quality may be influencing their movement um, and behavior. And if this is true, the non-forested areas might limit their ability to move from patch to patch. And again, limited dispersal leads to loss of genetic diversity, amongst other consequences. Um, but is forest cover and patch size enough to manage for spotted skunks? Or do we need to look within those uh, forested areas to find out uh, at the fourth order scale, um, what res resource selection looks like. So my fourth chapter was to evaluate den use and microhabitat selection at the fourth order scale, which would be the selection of specific resources within a skunk's home range. To do this, uh, we measured microhabitat characteristics within 10 meters of every um, spotted skunk den we can track to, and that included canopy cover, understory cover, distance to shrubs, uh, rocky cover, and woody cover. We also characterized their den characteristics as primary, which included the den type. The most common were underground burrows, followed by rocky crevices and tree cavities. Uh, but we also uh, looked at secondary den characteristics because not every rocky crevice and not every underground burrow was the same. So for example, these are both uh, three examples of an underground burrow, one covered by vegetation, one covered by a rocky pile, and one covered by nothing. Um, but there are also some other secondary den characteristics, like at the base of a tree, inside a root wad, or under a log, or inside, or inside or under a log or a stump. Um, and then there were these nice moments when uh, skunks decided they wanted to actually den in trash piles, which actually provides pretty good cover for them, much like a rocky or woody area. And the associations we found uh, were pretty strong. So with tree cavities, we found that breeding female or breeding individuals and non-breeding females. Uh, most often use hardwood trees, and it, within that, almost every single time, it was some species of oak, and that these trees were associated with small, woody, shrubby areas. Um, we were a little confused because breeding season actually takes place during the winter when uh, weather or temperatures are very low in, um, up at these high elevations, and you would think that an underground burrow would be a lot more stable than a tree cavity 25 feet up in the air. Um, however, we consistently tracked male and female pairs to these tree cavities that were very up high. And one of our hypotheses, hypotheses is that they're using chemical signaling to attract their mates. So as you might imagine, spotted skunks have very developed scent glands and they use them. And in species that have developed scent glands, it is very common for them to scent mark conspicuous objects. Now, if you're rare and you're antisocial and you have a hard time finding friends, scent marking something up in, in a tree that has no leaves might actually work out like a scent tell or a, a, like a scent tower that can actually you know let others know from a distance that you're there and you're ready for friendship. <laughs> um, uh, the next association we found was for underground burrows, and this was most commonly used by non-breeding males and also females with uh, non-ambulatory kits. So these are newborn kits. Um, burrows were most often found in mixed forests and, con and coniferous forests. They were often in large woody shrubs or under large woody shrubs, um, like rhododendron thickets, uh, in areas of greater canopy and understory cover and at higher elevations. Uh, newborn kits um, are born blind, deaf, and hairless, and they cannot spray, and they're basically helpless. Um, so underground burrows likely provide a stable moisture and temperature um, environment while they're developing, and then also provide some protection from uh, predators. Uh, rocky crevices were used almost immediately upon um, kit emergence from the den. Uh, when they were, you know, eyes were open, ears are open, able to move around and be crazy, the females almost immediately moved them to an area of rocky cover. Uh, so rock crevices were most associated with um, a lot more rocky ground cover, coarse woody debris, and less association with vegetative cover or canopy. 
Um, and as you can see, these kits actually blend in very well with the rocky cover. Rocky cover also provides uh, predator avoidance at a much better scale than an underground burrow. Uh, whereas with an underground burrow, a kit would have to run all the way back to the hole to avoid a predator. In a rocky outcrop like this, all they'd have to do is drop down between some boulders and they'd be safe to go. Sorry, the screen is stuck. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so management implications at the fourth order of selection. Um, spotted skunks do use a variety of den types. We actually already knew this. It's been published from several different areas. Um, however, it had not been noted that these den types may vary based on reproductive condition. Um, so trees are used during breeding season. We don't know why. That needs more investigation. Um, rocky crevices and underground burrows were strongly selected for by females with kits. That probably has kit survival um, linked with it. And then... Um, that might mean that for management, all den types and microhabitat characteristics might be necessary for a population to persist. So if reproductive cover is absent from the area, kit survival might be low and population recruitment might also be low. Um, so consideration of multiple sources of variation, not just what environmental characteristics are present on the landscape, um, but what the intrinsic characteristics of the individual using them um, are at the time uh, might be necessary for effective uh, habitat management. So just to recap, because I uh, presented a lot of information here, um, in my first chapter, I looked at first order selection and found that habitat is quite fragmented across the geographic landscape. My third chapter, we looked at home range uh, use and habitat selection within a home range uh, and found that not all forests are created equal. And then at the fourth order selection, we found that a variety of resources are used, but they're not all used at the same time by the same types of individuals. So if habitat is fragmented and uh, they're not as generalist as we thought, this might actually be restricting their ability to move from patch to patch if the area in between is unsuitable for them to exist in. So this leads me to my question of uh, what effect does this have on their, their genetic diversity? So, so chapter five is to assess genetic diversity and population structure. I did this by collecting samples at five different sites. Um, the same four, or same four sites in the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest, plus uh, West Virginia and the Monong Mon Monongahela <laughs> National Forest. Um, I was able to collect DNA from 65 individual spotted skunks. Uh, we amplified the DNA at 12 microsatellite loci. However, only eight of them amplified well enough to use in the analysis. And then seven of them actually proved to be polymorphic, so one of them had to be kicked out because it was monomorphic across all sites. Um, we sent these amplified fragments to the Cornell University um, Institute of Biotechnology, where they sized all the DNA fragments, um, sent them back to us, and then we scored those, those fragment sizes twice to make sure that they were accurate. Uh, we found that samples, our sample size varied across sites, despite the fact that we had pretty consistent trapping effort across all sites. So that suggests that there is some population size differences. Um, um, but the big takeaway from here is that allelic, ri allelic richness, allelic, uh, number of alleles in allelic range was all very low. In fact, uh, lower than the very small handful of spotted skunk genetic studies that have actually been done already. Um, and our land-dwelling uh, spotted skunks are actually more genetically consistent with island spotted skunks, which is a subspecies of western spotted skunks off the coast of California. So our land mammals are actually more genetically um, restricted or have low genetic diversity similar to an island-dwelling species, which also suggests that there's some isolation going on. Um, observed heterozygosity was lower uh, than expected for all but one of our populations, and that one population had the lowest sample size, and it was all males. And then uh, there's evidence that suggests recent bottlenecking at all of our sites, where our M ratio is less than 0.68 for every single one of our sites. Uh, to understand what this means as far as differentiation within the population goes, we looked at three measures of differentiation, including JOST, FST, and GST. 
Um, since all these results turned out to be about the same, I'm just going to present Joe's D here. Uh, the areas in bold and green are study sites that are significantly differentiated from each other. Um, as you can see, some sites are more differentiated from each other than others. So to get a visual of what this looks like, we use program structure to create a bar plot. Each one of these lines is a separate individual, and the colors represent how much of their uh, genetic material is uh, comes from one of these clusters. We tested to see if our data, how many clusters our data breaks up into. Um, we tested one through 10, the most supported was three. Um, North Track Mountain pulled out into its own cluster of indiv genetic individuals, and they were, as you can see, they're mostly purple. Um, Bald Mountain Sugar Run are mostly blue, and then white, uh, Wintergreen and White Top are mostly orange, although there is obviously some admixture because you see each of those three colors in each cluster. Um, so this is what it looks like on a map. Um, you can see that North Track Mountain up in West Virginia pulls out on its own, where we have the um, Bald Mountain and Sugar Run along the Appalachian Range, and then the Blue Ridge Cluster would be the Winter Green and White Top. Um, so what does this mean? How much, genetic or how much genetic diversity is actually explained by differences among these clusters? To do this, we uh, ran an AMOVA analysis, which is analysis of molecular variants. Um, we found that the greatest amount of genetic variation was explained by uh, variation within individuals. That's very typical. Um, you see that a lot in vertebrate species. In fact, it could be upwards, as, upwards of 90% or more. Um, but the takeaway from this analysis is that over 8% of variation in this population um, can be explained by differences between these three clusters. And that's actually fairly high. That's um, strong evidence that there is population differentiation happening here. Um, so we had evidence that these landscape factors are affecting, um, are, you know, fragmenting habitat. We have evidence that some of these populations are differentiated. So to understand how to, those two things relate to each other, uh, we conducted a least cost path analysis. So the maps that you're looking at here are elevation, land cover, and forest fragment, and the cost of travel for, um, for each cell on that map, red being highest level of cost, green being least costly to travel through. Uh, the blue line is an example of a least cost path um, that an individual could possibly take from our most central location, Bald Mountain, to the other four spots. And you can see that all three of these um, uh, habitat variables affect cost differently. The one in the bottom right hand corner is all three of those combined. Uh, we took least cost, or we estimated least cost paths for every pairwise relationship among the skunks and um, use information theoretic approach for model selection and found that by combining forest fragmentation, land cover, and elevation into one model, um, it best explains the uh, very or best explains the relationship between relatedness um, amongst these pop these subpopulations or sample sites. However, there's a lot of competing models in this set, including just straight isolation by distance, which is the Euclidean distance among sites, as well as the null model, which would say that there is no relationship between landscape and um, genetic relatedness. However, considering that these sites are about 150 to 300 meters apart, and we already know that a skunk's average home range is roughly five kilometers squared. It is not surprising at all that distance alone would uh, be an isolating factor amongst these particular study sites. But it does provide evidence that forest fragmentation, land cover type, and elevation is influencing it to some extent. So to kind of get an idea of what that means, uh, this is a chart of the estimated number of migrants per generation, which is around two-ish years for a skunk generation. Um, and if you look at the smallest numbers on this table, you're looking about roughly one to two um, genetic migrants per generation. And these are going through uh, sites where you'd have to travel through a lot of that high cost area, a lot of that red to orange area Whereas the sites that have the higher numbers of genetic, mig or genetic migrants, um, you're traveling through a lot more of that green or low cost area. So what does that mean? Um, well, that does have an influence on effective population size because the more connectivity you have to another site, the higher your effective population size will be. Um, now, because our sample sizes were very low to begin with and genetic diversity was very low to begin with, some of these estimates were not able to be defined. 
Um, however, you can see two things that are important. One, sample size is not correlated with effective population size. And two, all of these numbers are below the 5500 rule for short-term persistence and long-term adaptivity. Also, it's, uh, there's evidence of inbreeding amongst uh, three out of five of these sites. Uh, so the more uh, uh, isolated you are from each other, the more likely you are to be inbred. However, the two sites that don't show inbreeding are Bald Mountain and Sugar Run, which are in that Appalachian cluster and are very closely um, lo uh, located together in space. So that makes sense that there's probably some good gene flow among them. And then lo also looking at relatedness and inbreeding, uh, the number of primary relatives that we captured was actually very high. In fact, it ranged from 14 to about 30%. Um, and the top two graphs on here are sites where we have known kit and mother relationships, but the bottom two are still really high and we did not catch kits at any of those sites. Um, so these were all, in, the, the bottom two sites were all independent captures. So what does this mean? At least for genetics, um, low genetic diversity across the, um, across the population in Virginia and West Virginia. Um, there's evidence that there's isolation by landscape barriers, um, differentiation of subpopulations within this, the, the Virginia, West Virginia population. And that differentiation is likely driven by genetic drift. That's because if you are not getting individuals moving from one patch to another, uh, you're likely to lose um, allelic diversity um, and if you're not having new, new immigrants come into your population, bringing in new genes, basically, uh, you're not gonna get any genetic rescue. And eventually your populations are going to be fixed to just a few number of alleles. And um, there's also inbreeding evident in, evidence in some of these populations, plus low effective population sizes, uh, which do not meet the 5500 rule of persistence and adaptability. Uh, which means left on their own in this current state, eventually um, genetic diversity will continue to drop. So overall, this was a huge project and a lot of chapters, so to sum it up, overall, spotted skunks might be in need of active management. Um, their habitats fragmented across simple, uh, central Appalachia. Um, they do require these large core forests um, that are at least bigger than one home range. Um, and those large patches might be um, important for persistence of these populations. But forest cover itself isn't the most important thing and it's not all that matters. Uh, spotted skunks may not be as generalist as we once thought they were. They might require specific resources within these forested areas. Um, and these resor this resource use might be related to forest type, age, elevation, and then female reproductive status. Uh, directed forest management actions are recommended to prevent further loss of genetic diversity. And these actions include increasing habitat connectivity. And we can do this through forest management practices that would also benefit many species that require the same type of habitat as spotted skunks. So to do this, we can use forest thinning practices, which is um, creating canopy gaps by topping, girdling, or cutting down trees. Uh, we can cut down or basically kill um, non-mass producing trees, promote oak growth, promote understory growth, um, maintain these large core forest areas, um, and then a large, enlarge current forest patches and redu to reduce the amount of edge space and then also create corridors, uh, travel corridors among these patches. Um, in addition, I recommend we continue the genetic assessments that we just started. Uh, we need to aim to increase genetic diversity or at least at the minimum prevent further loss. And we can do this through habitat connectivity, which would allow individuals to move from patch to patch and naturally distribute their genetic material. Um, also, we need to sample areas in between and beyond the sites that we sampled in the study. Um, like I mentioned, these sites are pretty far apart from each other. So it's difficult to tease out the effects of distance versus actual um, land, the landscape effect. And we know that there are spotted skunks out there that we haven't sampled, uh, but it will require a lot more manpower and a lot more resources to go out and sample them all. Um, if we can find those unknown the subpopulations, it could mean that there's the possibility of genetic rescue. Um, we can also determine neighborhood size and limitations to genetic migration, not just physical movement. Um, and then we can better assess at a smaller, finer scale um, landscape genetics uh, with more detail than I was able to do in this analysis. 
Um, but it's not all doom and gloom because we know way more about spotted skunks than we did when we first started. Uh, we were able to successfully able to assess uh, all four orders of habitat selection on a species that we basically knew nothing about in Virginia. Um, but there's still a lot more questions out there that need to be answered. Uh, we were not able, we have anecdotal evidence on diet, but we're not able to do a diet analysis. Um, there's a lot of questions related to population dynamics and vital rates, such as um, reproductive rates and survival. Um, there's a lot of behavioral data that's, that's out there that we weren't able to uh, assess. Um, there's still questions about disease, uh, rabies transfer, uh, distemper, which is a huge problem for other species of spotted skunks in Central and South America. Um, so it's important to continue spotted skunk research in Central Appalachia um, and uh, elsewhere. However, there's a lot of research going on elsewhere, so uh, my primary focus is here. Uh, so with that, uh, a lot of help went into this project, and I would like to thank a whole lot of people um, including VDGIF and the USGS, which um, funded this project, um, as well as West Virginia DNR, U.S. Forest Service, and the Nature Conservancy, and the Nature Foundation at Wintergreen, who all allowed us access uh, to their land to do the sampling. Um, Virginia Tech, of course, for having me here as a student and letting me TA for way too many semesters. Um, the Virginia Master Naturalist, who provided an incredible amount of volunteer help on this project. Um, my advisor, Dr. Mark Ford, who has put up with me for five and a half years and has uh, guided me and had a lot of patience this entire time. Um, my committee, Dr. Marcella Kelly, Dr. David Jahowski, and Dr. Eric Hellerman, who have provided an incredible amount of knowledge and guidance and has helped me walk through this process. Um, I especially like to thank uh, Mike Fees, who is the reason why this project even existed in the first place, and also Dr. Sarah Carpenter and Dr. Dean Stoffer, who I've been TAing with for the last several semesters. Um, you guys have been like honorary committee members to me, and I, I, I really appreciate everything you've done for me. Um, Dana, Keith, and Terry Wade, they have the patience of a saint. I don't know how they do their job, but they're so good at it. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, and then also the rest of the VT faculty and staff that I wasn't able to add to the slide. Um, it's really, it's really a, 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 group, a group project and a family here. Um, my parents, Brian and Terry Thorne, who um, always encouraged me to be weird as a kid, helped me go down this path that I'm on now. Um, and my boyfriend, Jeremy, who I don't think he knew what he was getting into when he met me, so thanks for sticking, sticking by. Um, a lot of hands uh, did this actual research for me in areas where I couldn't because it's a big study area and it's one spot. So Chuck Waggy, Josh Palumbo, Emily Seipel, and Evan Luer, you guys were the backbone to this project, and um, it could never have been completed on the scale that it is right now, or that it has been, so thank you so much for that. Um, as well as my lab mates and friends who have been here for me um, throughout the last several years and are pro hopefully probably watching at home or at work, uh, hopefully at home. Um, thank you all. Uh, this is truly an amazing experience, and I'm I'm so glad I got to be got to be here and do this all. So thank you. Uh, now, uh, if anybody has questions, I'd be more than happy yeah, to answer we them. Have, uh, we have we have questions from the audience. All right. Are you ready for the first one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Blake Sassy. All right, Blake. Uh, he asked, uh, from the 2017 paper, you use reconics and Bushnell cameras, and uh, that there's been doubt raised about the reconics cameras to detect small species. Should you consider comparing detectability between the camera types to see if that might alter the conclusion? Uh, we did. That's an excellent question. And I uh, concur. The reconics cameras were terrible. Um, we only had four of them across our entire site, and I stopped using them uh, pretty early on because we were missing detections. We knew that the bait was getting eaten. We were missing detections even of large animals, so we actually stopped using them. But there was so little data to be able to compare um, detection rates of any of the species across cameras. We tried, and in our models, it didn't really turn out to it, it, it was it was a terrible covariate because of the data was so so slim um but uh, just personally i would recommend for spotted skunks don't go the reconics route marie all right okay so um it looks like we're seeing similar patterns to structure um uh, with um that 
the view show uh, for um, skunks in the, in the West. Um, do you think it's, uh, instead of uh, breeding status, do you think it's possible that structure choice is driven by temperature patterns? Uh, yes. Uh, so the question was, is um, structure pattern uh, driven by, could it be driven by temperature pattern, not just breeding status? Um, yes. Actually, I didn't present it here because I was worried about time, but we looked at um, a lot of temperature variables and weather variables um, with our redundancy analysis. Um, and yes, there are some very strong associations there. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk about those with you when my, I will put my, the, my dissertation out and that will be in the publication. So sorry, I didn't have a chance to talk about it today. But yes, that is also um, uh, very influential and they do not quite line up perfectly with reproductive status or season. So um, it, it, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, a lot of it is when you have expected so uh, atmospheric pressure, which is barometric pressure that accounts for elevation since we're in the mountains, um, is one of the best predictors of what type of din dinning resources and cover they're going to use uh, to where if you're expecting really poor weather or if the pressure drops and you're going to be getting that poor weather, um, they are mostly using those underground burrows and those, um, those rocky areas to where under um, like clear sky, nice weather, they're using a lot more um, vegetative cover. And that goes along with the avoidance of predators to where if you are, uh, if you're, if it's a really, you're a small mammal, you get eaten by birds and it's really bright night, you wanna be under that, those, those covered areas where you're not gonna be seen by, um, uh, by the predators or as easy to catch, so. Okay, Brandon. Brandon, Brandon. thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Okay. Um, he asked about uh, the, for the crazy range of veg type trees in the Appalachians, but when you go outside the Appalachians in Tennessee and Kentucky, um, in the Highland Rim, parts of Piedmont to the east of us, they're absent. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the uh, plains version is in mixed tall grass prairies. And so he wants to know what your thoughts are on, on how come there are no spotted skunks and Illinois, Indiana, Ohio are the, the southeastern states outside the Appalachians, or at least, you know, in this mid-south kind of region. I think, so I can't speak for the entire Midwest. I know the Plain Spotted Skunk is a huge, huge project out there. Um, but if I can equate that question towards more like the Piedmont area here, once you get past the Blue Ridge, um, you're getting down into that low elevation. Species composition isn't usually a big deal, so you would think that, hey, it's low elevation, it's a lot of structure, a lot of cover, skunk should be there. Um, but what we found is that they're not using open areas, they're not using farmland, like striped skunks or raccoons or something will use farms. They will eat the corn, they'll eat the soybeans, they'll, they'll do that. Spotted skunks don't seem to be going into those open areas. Um, I haven't dug far enough in there to tell you why I can speculate. Um, but my guess is that because of those lower elevations, they're more developed and they might not be huge city centers, but they're still developed in the sense that they're not natural forested land. Or if there is natural forested land, there's a lot of space, a lot of gap between them that has been turned into agricultural land. And so it could just be that even though if a spotted skunk is physically capable of moving that far, it might just be that uh, mortality events are so high in those areas that they can't get from, you know, one patchy area or one good patch to another good patch without dying while crossing through a terrible patch. So, um, yeah, I can't speak to the Midwest, but that's kind of our, that's what we suspect is happening, why spotted skunks are not down in the Piedmont area, which is kind of similar to that. I hope. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. So. Uh, Mike Fees. So, he wants to know uh, what the potential, uh, or what do you think about controlled burning and large patches have for habitat management? Um, I think that's going to vary depending on what type of patch you're already looking at. So if you're in an area that already has really good understory cover and it's got a lot of hard mass production and it's like prime, in this case, prime spotted skunk, but also great for turkey and deer, um, I light, like light burnings publication showed that light burnings to help maintain that um, has been really, really great. Um, really intense, really hot burns that just destroy all of the understory is not going to be beneficial to spotted skunks. If you're in an area that is kind of um, 
a middle age to mature stand where it's a closed canopy there's no understory um burning is even those intense burns that will help regenerate that understory that will create canopy gaps and it will help oak regeneration so depending on the site that in question um i think it really you got to think about what your ultimate goals are and what the status of that stand looks like at the moment Uh, so our, well, so for error rate, I guess, for our um, VHS data is actually pretty low. Uh, we, I don't have the number off the top of my head. I'll have to get back to you on that, Heather. But um, in order to account for error when we are doing triangulation, we actually would, every time we would track a skunk to its den, we would first triangulate its location. And then we would compare the difference between where our triangulated lo location was to our den site. Um, and then that would be our estimated error. Um, anything above one standard deviation outside that mean, we kicked out uh, for our just telemetry, triangulation telemetry only data. Um, because we're up in the mountains and there's a lot of bounce, uh, our sample size did get a little bit smaller because uh, there is a lot of area in mountainous area, or a lot of error in mountainous areas. Um, so I can get back to you on the actual fix rate on that. I don't have that in front of me right now. What was the second part? Uh, second question is home range overlap. Did you examine uh, volumetric overlap or polygon overlap? Uh, great question. It was volumetric intersection. Okay. And then the third question is how did you calculate landscape resistance? Uh, there, okay. So calculating the actual cost of landscape resistance is very finicky and it's very important for um, a cost distance analysis. Um, what we did was in our earlier chapter where we calculated the um, selection ratios of different habitat types, we took those selection ratios um, and we multiplied it on several, um, uh, several levels of magnitude. So we started anything equal to one was held constant at one at every level of magnitude. So uh, anything different from one was either multiplied by 10, uh, um, 100, or 1,000. Uh, we did a preliminary analysis to find out which which level of magnitude actually um, explained the best variation. Uh, in our case, it was the the 1,000 multiplying it by 1,000. Um, and if anybody's interested in how that's done, I have a couple great papers that explain it in depth, and I can send those your way. As long, uh, just send me an email. I believe that's all the questions from Cyberspace. Okay. Any. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, any any of my five audience members have some questions for me? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, you uh, you talked about the connectivity as a primary management tool, but you didn't say anything about translocation. I wondered if, if you look at the different populations you explored, is there any one of those that has uh, a, a, enough genetic variation or different composition of genetic composition? composition that would warrant being a, a good source for translocating? I mean, is that just not done? Um, yeah, okay, so for those listening, the question was, um, I talked about habitat connectivity as a tool to increase genetic diversity, um, but is there um, any thought on using translocation of populations that already have high genetic um, diversity? Um, and the question, or the answer that I would have for you is, one, we don't have enough data to support that. Because our sites are so far apart and we have not sampled anything in between, I would like to do that first um, to make sure that um, it's worth the time and effort and then uh, the, the strain that it has on the actual individuals that get transferred. Um, so if, if, it, if it ever came down to it, like, yeah, we need to translocate, our Bald Mountain population would probably be the best source out of the five sites that we've sampled. Um, they do have the, the one of the higher, or they had one of the higher sample um, sizes. Uh, we had great capture rates. We had multiple males and females. All of our females were reproductive. Um, and they were also um, the site that did not show strong inbreeding. Um, so that would probably be our source population. But I don't think we're, we're there yet. I think if we can try habitat management, um, not only would it benefit 
I mean, we would still have to follow up and find out if it's actually working, but it would benefit more at a community or ecosystem level than, than moving spotted skunks around would, and then also be less stressful and more natural for the individuals themselves. So, did that answer your question? Okay. Dr. Hellerman. Any sense of male or pre mating dispersal in valleys? Sort of get at that. How far do they range in the way? So. Sort of, yes. Uh, we tried to look at that. Obviously, dispersal is insanely difficult to study, especially in these small animals. Um, we assessed uh, extra home range movements, which is basically an excursion outside of your typical home range to which you return to your home range. Um, and there's a, there's a method to distinguish that. If anyone's interested, let me know. I'll send you the paper. Um, and what we found is that every movement that we can detect of an individual outside of its typical home range, they always returned. Um, and if they did not return, it resulted in a mortality. Uh, also, um, because their home ranges were really small to begin with, there were, there were very few extra home range movements, um, and it was about equally divided between males and females. So based on the data that I have right now, uh, I don't think there's a lot of long-range dispersal happening, but again, that's that's really hard to track. Um, so we're trying to get at that with the um, like not genetic number of genetic migrants and relatedness among populations. Um, but, but that still goes back to our sites are all really far apart. So if we sampled closer, like within like closer sites sites together, that might actually be easier to detect for the individuals that. Um, we did, we did lose signal on some individuals. Um, we were able to attribute most of those to collar malfunctions with antennas breaking off. For the ones we were never able to recapture, we drove everywhere to try and pick up their signal and were not able to. So either they dispersed really far or their collars just broke and we never saw them again. So. Three more questions for All right. Um, Clint. Breeding behavior and condition observed only in the winter, or did you see it at any time in the spring? The only time we observed two spotted skunks dinning together, at least two collared spotted skunks, um, are also on camera, um, was during the kind of late February to early April time. So that's that's what we would consider um, breeding behavior is that a male and a female were in a den together, um, as opposed to females with kits, that doesn't count. But. Um, Marie again, um, um, you know, relative to the Western spotted skunk and the uh, lack of genetic diversity, what evidence do you have that, that uh, there, I assume you're just seeing these guys, genetic diversity will continue to decline? Um, the evidence we have that genetic diversity will continue to decline, um, I don't necessarily have evidence to present to you. It's just it, that is a very consistent thing that happens among isolated populations. There's a lot of publications out there that have shown it. Um, one way we can sort of backtrack and look on that is look at um, individuals in collections. Uh, so these are animals that were collected in the past and are now reside in uh, like like museum collections, we can compare genetic diversity from the pre-1940s, assuming there's enough specimens to do that with, and see if there are any differences. That can give us an idea if if this is just how spotted skunks have always been, or if there have been declines. Um, and then that can give us an idea of whether it's likely to decline in the future. But following the pattern of many other species, that's what we would expect to happen. Uh, Colleen in North Carolina wanted to ask about uh, uh, any major factors that help or hinder Yeah, actually, there, there's many. Um, so it took us five years to capture all this data. So we we figured out a lot of what to do and what not to do is over that time. Um, avoiding bright nights uh, is helpful. We do we did notice just anecdotally that trap success was lower. Uh, our trap success was actually biased very high, though, because um, in order to... I mean, our we, we knew... We tried right away to do trapping grids um, and look at, you know try to estimate population size and recapture rates and stuff that clearly very right up right away was not going to work. Um, so we had to do directed trapping efforts. So if we thought there was an area where there would be spotted skunks, we would set out another camera station, we'd bait it. And as soon as that a skunk showed up on camera, we would put traps out that night. So if I checked the camera 
and a spot I, if I was out there in the morning I checked the camera and a spotted skunk had been there that night now there's an art to this if there was still bait left I used I used raw chicken I never had success with sardines or cat food if there was still bait left I could set the traps that night I used a mixture of peanut butter bacon grease and oats but sometimes I just threw chunks of raw bacon and that works just as well I could set six or fewer traps and I would almost always get a skunk that night now, if I checked the trap, there was a skunk on camera that night and there was no bait left, it would take two to three more nights for that skunk to come back around. So I would go back a couple days later, check to, you know, see if there was still bait, put the traps out and almost always catch the skunk on its, on it. it's like they loop around. So it almost always do that. So if you're going out to, if, if your goal is not to uh, estimate abundance or density and it's just to get collars out, I strongly recommend a method like that. Um, drawing them in, day like for several nights in a row with food um is going to help i also noticed i don't know how relevant this is for the more southern states but um at, if it's going to dump snow spotted skunks are pretty much the only thing that comes out after it dumps snow and you're less likely to get triggers from raccoons and squirrels and possums uh, so that was helpful um, and we didn't really trap the only time we trapped in the summer was when we were trapping for kits and i literally put a couple baited traps um, right outside the mom's den and I would catch her every single time and if you line those traps up right next to each other you will likely catch the kits as well they tend to be less interested in the food they just want to figure out mom's in a box I want to be next to mom and they often will go in the trap that's next to mom and you can catch them all so. <laughs> any more questions <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all very much for tuning in today. I greatly appreciate it. So, so that's it. I think you did a, a very good job. I think there's no more questions. Uh, obviously, there's not going to be uh, – nobody's going to go out to a bar tonight. Uh, but the uh, um, archaic um, alcohol laws of Virginia have been recently changed. So you are more than welcome to send uh, Wine of the Month or Beer of the Month <laughs> Club to Emily. Thanks for attending. And she's going to put this up. The PowerPoint, it's, this was recorded, this I think. This was recorded, so uh, if anybody wants a recording of it or has colleagues that wanted to watch, um, I will be sending it out to the Skunk Group. Um, anybody that's not on the skunk, Eastern Spotted Skunk Lift Serve, let me know. I can also send you um, a copy of it. Okay. Just give me a day or two. <laughs> okay. I guess you can end the presentation. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you all for being here.